platform, and it's great to have you with us today. So the future of work, artificial intelligence, disruption, and robotics, are all terms that we are constantly bombarded with. We are told our jobs are under threat and our industries will be taken over by robots. Sure, this might be true, but for the, the forward-thinking leaders, for the people like you, these realities also offer real opportunities for improvement, for reinvention, for growth. And that's exactly what our speakers here today are helping you to do. By the time we leave here today, you'll have a number of practical, immediate, actionable things to do on your to-do list that will future-proof yourself, your people, and your business. Actions which you can start to implement immediately as you get back to your desk. Before we get into the speakers for the day, we've got a couple of house rules. The emergency exits are clearly marked, and uh, the assembly point in case there's a fire is across the road at the gates on the other side of the road. You have a Wi-Fi code on your desk uh, on a piece of paper. It's not the fastest of uh, internet speeds so that will get you through the morning. Bathrooms are out the doors, those back doors, and a little turn to your right. The smoking areas are clearly marked, so please use those. Please manage your devices for those uh, sitting at the table with you. We then have Michael and Sharon who will be sitting at the back of the room. Um, please feel free to make use of them during the course of the morning to make your stay with us uh, that more memorable. If you need to make uh, them to make a call for you, or even uh, you know, do some mod here in the suite. So, proceedings for the day, we'll see two speakers presenting before uh, we take our first break at 10 a.m. We will then have two more speakers taking us through to the break at 12. Our final speaker, employee engagement and workplace guru, Steph UPC, will close out the day, and I promise we'll try our best to have a hard close by 1.15. If we do run a few minutes late, it will be by minutes, not hours. So today, we are fortunate to have with us a few of the top professional speakers in South Africa. These thought leaders are trusted by CEOs to help them improve how they and their people do things. And between them, these five speakers present at hundreds of conferences the world over. So on to our first speaker, Dr. Graham Codrington, who is sure to set the tone for today's present uh, conversation. This speaker has seen the future and he loves it. Graham tracks the trends that will change the world in the next decade. With five best-selling books to his name and a travel schedule that saw him go to 24 countries just last year, Graham is one of the world's most sought-after experts in the future of work. This morning, he will show you what you need to do to be successful in tomorrow's world. Please welcome the CEO of Tomorrow Today Global, Dr. Graham Huffington. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time out. And I'm going to start by giving you some insight into the research that our team has done recently on the future of work, setting the scene. And then the other speakers are going to come through the rest of the conference this morning uh, and unpack key areas. Uh, of that topic. I don't know if you've checked your diaries recently, but it's going to be the 2020s in 14 months' time. A few of you just think, <laughs> uh, you haven't been concentrating then. Uh, I know we're coming up to the end of this year and we're kind of focused on what has to happen in the next few weeks to close out 2018 well, but the 2020s are coming, and I don't know about you, that always felt like the real future for me. You know, 21st century, sure, but the 2020s does seem just to have some kind of magic in our minds about we were supposed to be in the future. I want my hoverboard, my self-lacing shoes, and definitely a flying car or two uh, to come around. A few years ago, Bill Gates was asked what he was expecting for the 2020s, and I agree with him entirely that I think the 2020s are going to be one of the most remarkable decades in human history. If you think the last few years have been filled with change, you ain't seen nothing yet. The last 20 years have simply given us the building blocks that we need to actually do something interesting. But everything that we know, from the internet and cell phones to quantum computing on the one side to uh, advances like gene therapy uh, and gene editing and flying cars and driverless cars which are coming, the 3D printing and everything else in between. All of these things are actually only building blocks for changes that are going to come in the next five to 10 years. 
In other words, if I can change the analogy, the last 20 years was about warming up. Now we're ready to start running. So if you think you've been moving fast, if you think you've had to deal with a lot of change in the last 10 years, yeah, buckle your seatbelts. It's going to get interesting. And in this world of the 2020s, we need to realize that the rules are changing. We can't just keep doing what we were doing, just doing it cheaper, better, faster. That's not going to be good enough anymore to keep up. We actually have to change the rules of the game. I, I love this quote. I think mean, this is probably my favorite quote at the moment. That it is more important for us to engineer agility into our organizations, in fact, into ourselves. Uh, and that, in fact, is the theme of all of the speakers this morning. Uh, learning how to build that agility into the system. So we don't just take what we were doing and just do it slightly better than we have been doing it, but that we actually learn new ways of doing and being. So this is what my team and I are fascinated on and, and focused, uh, focused on, fascinated about and focused on. We try and understand these disruptive forces and then make sense of them for our clients. About two years ago, we put our research team into doing two different research projects. The first project was as we looked ahead to the 2020s. We wanted to know what would a talented person look like in the 2020s. In other words, if you're an organization and you're needing to go out and employ people and get people into your team, if you're trying to think about what do I need to train my people for, how do I need to develop them, what are going to be some of the skills that they need in order to deliver successfully into the 2020s? Uh, and even more importantly, how do I develop my team so that they are ready for anything that comes, this whole engineering agility into the system. Now, we're lucky enough as a team to have a massive global base. We have offices uh, across the world, from Toronto to London, Zurich to Singapore, and a, a nice client base uh, that spans every industry and mo all the continents and most countries. And we work with companies, big and small, and big multinationals, and I'm um, guessing some of you guys uh, in the room here as well. So we had a nice base of people to go and speak to. And that research team went on their way. The second research team was asked to have a look at what is going to happen when automation comes to the workplace. Now, this picture is the entirely wrong picture. I'm going to give you a website at the end where you can download my slides. And I probably should have put a big red X through this slide so that you remember I'm being ironic with this photograph. Because this isn't, in fact, what it's going to look like when the robots come for our jobs. Of course, when the robots come for our jobs, they're going to come in the form of our mobile phones, in the form of software and algorithms. And they're not actually going to come for our jobs. They're going to come for specific tasks that we do. Now, of course, there are going to be some jobs that disappear entirely. But for most of us, it's going to be us and the machines working together, with the machines doing some stuff and the machines not being able to do other stuff. And that's what our second research team focused their uh, attention on. What is it that the robots can't do uh, as we go into the future? Now, we did discover that there are going to be some jobs of course, where the robots can do 100% of the job, like call centers. Okay, we, we're going to end, be able to empty out all those robo calls that you now get from people who sound like half of a person anyway when they're phoning you. Like, really, I've gone on a trick and this is what I'm doing for my life. Um, yes, sir, I am trying to sell you some extra insurance, but, and then you put the phone down. Now, that will be a whole lot nicer for the whole of humanity if robots did that uh, <laughs> rather than people. It would be even better if nobody did it. Um, so, anyway, that's maybe an aspirational picture for society. Uh, but let me just make sure that we understand where we are here, because it isn't just low skill repetitive jobs that are going to be replaced. This revolution, often called the 
to the fourth industrial revolution is, is coming from the professionals. Uh, it, it's coming from the highly qualified people. But highly qualified people who, even though their jobs are complicated, are nevertheless doing fairly repetitive things and following a very strict, whatever the word is in the industry, protocol. A very strict step by step. These are the steps you must do and you must follow these and if you don't follow them you will be sued. Um, those professionals are absolutely right uh, for automation. So my favorite example of this is the doctor. Okay? Not not a highly qualified and specialized surgeon or anything, but the family doctor uh, that you go off to when, when you've got a little bit of a sore throat. No more. Something's a little bit wrong with you. Not, not, not as I say, the specialist. So how many of you would be very comfortable never going to your family doctor again and replacing your doctor with an algorithm, some software, uh, a computer? Okay, that's a fair percent, that's about 25% of the audience. Maybe it's because you're at a future of work conference, you're a little bit more predisposed to say, you know, I don't need to speak to humans anymore. The average audience I speak to, most people are saying, the doctor, no. You know, that, that feels like a bit of a personal touch. Uh, let me explain the problem with that thinking, if you haven't put your hand up enough. Uh, you see, your doctor, has three problems. The first problem is that your doctor only gets the diagnosis right about 73% of the time. That's true, by the way. Many of the medical counselors around the world have investigated this. You know this for sure, because one in four times, you've got to go back to the doctor the next week, uh, the first bit of medicine didn't work out. So I don't know if you're comfortable with that click rate, okay? Um, it's like taking your car in to get new tires and they give you three new tires and they just lead to the fourth one. Okay? And you'll go, well, you yeah, know, I'll be perfect. Um, I, I, no, no, it doesn't feel right to me uh, from a doctor. The second problem that we've got is that as much as this doctor is supposed to be one of the cleverest people, you know, it's, it's the cleverest people you went to school with, who went off to medical school. So, so we kind of revere doctors as super smart, but here's the problem, right? Let's say you go off to the doctor, you've got a little bit of a sore throat, you walk into the doctor. Now, there's not a lot of clever going on in that doctor's room, okay? I mean, honestly, let's say you walk into the doctor with a sore throat, what's the first thing the doctor's going to say to you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? How can I help? So you kind of go, no, 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 but that's why I'm here. If I knew what was wrong with me, I wouldn't be here. I'm, I'm here because I don't know what's wrong with me. Stupid starting question. But every doctor starts there, they haven't changed that in a thousand years. So anyway, I've got a sore throat, I explain to the doctor. So I've got a sore throat, let's do this real life case study. What, do you, what does the doctor do next? Okay, uh, give, give me the full rundown. You, you, you sound like you're making a Okay, I mean, it sounds like you sound very confident. You, you sound very confident. So, so give me the rundown. What's he going to do? That's he's going to check it, right? Yeah, yeah. which is a bit of a fever. And ah, okay, so he's going to check your chin pressure. Yeah, check your heart rate. Heart rate, check your blood pressure. Blood pressure, pulse. Are you sure you're not making it? <laughs> no, because this is honestly exactly what my doctor does, right? And it's exactly what your doctor does. And if your doctor didn't do it, you'd say, hang on, doc. What's going on? You missed something. You haven't checked my blood pressure yet, doc. It's called triage, by the way. Yeah. And it is a medically prescribed protocol. They have to do it. Even if you walk in and you say, uh, doctor says, uh, what's wrong with you? And you say, uh, doctor, my leg has been cut off. Your doctor will probably check in your nose, your ears, your blood pressure, listen to your chest, and then say, this is the leg looks bad. It's called triage. They must do it because it's part of the protocol. Why couldn't the machine do that? Then, of course, if it's a little bit beyond that, so they do all of that and you're looking pretty normal, 
then they have to send you what's the next thing they might do if they can't work it out. Blood test. Seriously, this is a medical conference or what? You guys are all on the ball. So blood test. How many of your doctors have ever done a blood test now? Now listen to my question. How many of your doctors have ever done the blood test? No. They send you off somewhere else, right? And there a nice nurse comes and takes a little blood out of you, they take it to the back, they drop some of that blood on a little slide of glass and they stick it under the microscope and somebody checks it out, right? No. If you believe that, you've been watching way too much CSI. Okay? That's not what happens at all. They take the blood out of your body and they stick it into a machine. And the machine goes for about half an hour, then spits out a report which gets couriered back to your doctor in a nice brown envelope. Your doctor opens the envelope, pulls it out, phones you, and reads it to you. Why did we need the doctor in that system? I know I'm being cynical, and I know I'm summarizing for effect, but I'm not summarizing too much. Okay? The third problem that we have is even worse than that. And that is that your doctor has absolutely no financial incentive to make you better. Some of you are paying he just dropped quite seriously. Cook. Honestly, you only pay your doctor when you're sick, right? Wouldn't it be a much better system if we all paid our doctors every month we weren't sick? And if we got sick, we stopped paying the doctor. No, just imagine what a different relationship your doctor would have with the community. The doctor would phone you up and say, there's a serious strain of flu going around the neighborhood and I think you should be taking a flu shot. This, in fact, I'm outside your house and I'm out. <laughs> You're laughing, but I'm not wrong. So, there's all sorts of reasons why I'm thinking doctors are right for machines to take over. And then I can show you the machine. Because Watson, who's IBM's big machine, has been doing precisely this for the last seven years. Uh, having been originally a machine called Big Blue, which was the first machine to beat uh, Iranian chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov at chess, they then pushed this machine out of the gaming space and into the medical world. And Watson, other class known as Dr. Watson. <laughs> um, <laughs> computer nerds are such nerds. Uh, anyway, Dr. Watson has now been spending seven years reading every single medical textbook he ever written, looking at every single public medical database available, analyzing every single medical chart that has ever been presented to him. And by the way, you can log on and submit any of your own medical history for free and get Dr. Watson to have a look at uh, who you are, your symptoms, you can put in any gene testing you've done or anything else into the system. Now your doctor is running at 73% accuracy. They now put in your case files into this and see what Watson comes up with. Anyone want to take a guess what level of accuracy Watson's running at? 99.2%. Now, can I ask you my question again? Just, this is just a test for me to see if I'm a good and compelling speaker. How many of you would prefer to let a computer, specifically Dr. Watson, do your next doctor's consultation? <laughs> okay. Except, except, the last thing that I want to happen. If those tests, those blood tests come back, and it's not just the flu, it's something very bad. The last thing I want is for a computer to tell me the problem. <laughs> Can you read that at the back? <laughs> Don't you like the options? Yeah. No, 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 no. Can you 
cancel. I don't know, there's not even a help button here. And this would be the problem, right? So this is what our research team was after. Because by the way, I could have done this little exercise with accountants, with lawyers, with engineers, with actuaries, with architects, even with vets. Which means, by the way, if you're not careful about it, the job interview of the future might look a little bit like this. to think about what could be. 
not just what is. Computers know what is and what isn't, and computers know what they must do and what they mustn't do, but they don't think about what they should do or what they could do. Uh, and, and we need to bring that. Uh, that's kind of, these are in no particular order except that's the first one as a sort of foundation for all the others. I, I think we're going to need a lot of imagination um, to conceive of what our world could be. And I think we're going to live a better life in the 2020s if we don't just let life happen to us. Uh, but if we get ahead of the game. You know, one of the biggest things we need to be doing uh, in the way that we manage our businesses, in the way that we create our, our strategies, uh, in the way we develop our leaders, in the way we fit cultures and our organization and our organizational cultures together, one of the biggest things we can do is remove surprise as an element. Surprise is wonderful in your personal life. Birthdays, Christmas presents, magnificent to be surprised. It's not such a great business strategy, right? I mean, imagine the vision statement of your organization with, with the key strategic goals and all of those wonderful things, trust, integrity, optimism, customer service, and surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. OK. So horizon scanning helps us to see the future, to see what's coming and remove the element of surprise. Adaptive intelligence and complex problem solving. Um, is, is a key skill. Now, you might say, well, hang on, aren't computers good at doing this? No. Computers are good at doing complicated things. They do very complicated things and do them fast and brilliantly, but complexity is something else. And complexity is where AI is going to fall down. So AI can do some superbly amazing things. So some of you might have seen this video a few weeks ago. This is the CEO of Google introducing Google's latest AI assistant. And by the way, I don't like the name AI because I think it gives us all the wrong pictures. I prefer IA. I think AI will be IA in the 2020s, intelligent assistance. That's what I think AI is bringing to us in the 2020s, intelligent help. And one of the helps that we can get is the computer can actually make phone calls on our behalf. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a hacker appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule an appointment for you. Let's listen. Yeah, you, you, you got stuck with Siri, 
Okay, Siri is rubbish. Okay, Apple know it, by the way. They employ about 15 very, very smart people this year from all these other companies that are doing this stuff to try and fix Siri. Now, if you only know Siri, yeah, it, it, it's, it's rubbish. Let me show you one. I, I brought an Alexa with me here. Um, so I'm just going to plug her into the system here. And let's just check. Alexa. Alexa, are you connected to the internet? I am connected to the internet. Excellent. So now I can ask her any question you would ask Google um, and get kind of an immediate answer. So, you know, something simple like uh, Alexa. Alexa, multiply 232,518 by 753. 232,518 multiplied by 753 equals 175,086,054. See who the accountants are now. Well, maybe that's just the BDS accountants. <laughs> whatever the number, whatever. This is big numbers. <laughs> uh, you can ask. As I say, literally any question. So, Alexa, what is the capital of Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan's capital city is Estonia. And Alexa, what is the population of Estonia? As of 2017, the population of Estonia, Kazakhstan, is 1.03 million. That's my good answer because she even contextualized it. She told me how far back the last count had gone. That contextualization is really cool. So, for example, Alexa, when will Manchester United play again? Manchester United will play in the Premier League this Saturday at 2.30 p.m. away against Bournemouth. How's that for an answer? So if you're a sports fan, that's, she could have just said Saturday, and we would have said, oh, excellent, you gave the right answer. She gave us a lot more than we asked for with everything we needed. And that's pretty much what you get out of it. Although, of course, <laughs> Manchester United thanks the technical answer to my question about when Manchester United will start playing again is confidence. Now, the other, the, the other thing that Alexa does is had, no, she knows every single song ever written. Uh, she, in fact, was playing the music as we walked in, just on the basis of Alexa, playing music by Mango Groove. I can't find songs by Mango Roof. Ah, yeah, well, I'm going to speak, speak uh, Alexa, play music by Mango Groove. Shuffling songs by Mango Groove on Amazon Music. Okay, so well, off you go. Alexa, what song is this? This is Move Up from Mango Groove by Mango Groove. And off you go. Alexa, box, uh, stop. Thank you. Now, what Alexa is going to be able to do for us in the future is things like, uh, Alexa, I need an appointment with Alex. Please arrange it. And Alex and I have both integrated our diary systems with the Alexa ecosystem in the machine, the AI, the intelligent assistant can do it for us. Alexa, I need to go to Cape Town on Friday. Please arrange the travel. And off it goes. So intelligent assistance is coming our way. And that can do fairly complicated things. But let me give you a nice example of what's complex rather than complicated. The land issue in South Africa is not a difficult issue to solve. It really isn't. Every single piece of land in the country only needs five questions asked. Who owns the land now? Who used to own the land? Who should own the land? How much is it worth? And who will pay? Do you agree with me? If we find the answer to those five questions, the land issue is solved. So I think we should just program Alexa with those five questions 
Then all of us can just go to whatever land where we go to this land we are now and we say, Alexa, do the land thing. <laughs> and then she'll ask and answer the questions that she'll tell us. So people should own this land and the EFF will pay. Um, and, and everybody will be happy, right? Because it's 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 complicated but easy when you let them in. No. Okay, they're all looking at me like I've gone crazy. That's not gonna solve anything. Because the land issue is not complicated, but it is complex. Why is it complex? Because it has human emotions involved. Because it has relationships. Because it has culture. Because it has people in the system. And that's why we need some creativity to the mix. That should be fairly obvious as a human contribution to the system. We need a little bit of personal intelligence. We need to know ourselves, our EQ, if you prefer. And, of course, we need a little bit of diversity intelligence as well, so that we can understand why different cultures have such different relationships with the land. Does that make sense? It's just a simple example. Although, of course, not so simple because it's complex. Now, the next one on the list might be interesting. As you looked at us, that you might have paused at curiosity. What's curiosity and storytelling got to do with business? You know, heavy stuff like future of work. Well, I think it's got everything to do with it. Uh, may, uh, let me tell you what. First of all, curiosity is the basis of all innovation. Asking, does it have to be this way? Why is it like that? Those sort of questions, asking great questions, is, is the key to innovation. And next point, <laughs> your computers are not curious. In fact, that would be very weird if you said to me, my Samsung Galaxy 7 is a very curious one. It asks me the strangest questions. I mean, I tell you to get rid of that witchcraft uh, because something's gone wrong there. Uh, phones do what they're told. Devices do what they're told. Uh, software does what it's programmed to do. It's not curious about the rest of the world. And that, I think, is a key part of the definition of intelligence in my opinion is this ability to ask questions. But let me preempt uh, a, a little bit, because the speakers coming up are going to pick up on some of these themes. Uh, Douglas, for example, is going to talk to us about the rules, the rules that we don't even know that we know, but we kind of obey them anyway. And then he's going to ask us to ask some questions. And Alex is going to talk about what that means from a leadership perspective. So I'm going to steal his thunder, but I do want to just say one thing, that we need to shift our model of leadership. I think we've got a bad model of leadership that's based on putting people in charge who think they know everything. And we think that the people who should be promoted are the people with all the answers. That was fine in the past. But if we are heading into the 2020s, like I suggested, a time of deep disruption, a time of exponential change, if that's the future we're facing, then nobody's got the answers. And by the way, it doesn't matter how good your answers are, if you ask the wrong questions, your answers are meaningless. So this is what Richard Feynman, a great philosopher of science, a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, said about science. Let me make it about leadership very quickly this morning. I would much rather work for a boss who had questions that are difficult to answer than work for somebody who has answers that are difficult to question. What type of workplace culture do you have? Do you even know what your workplace culture is? Or are some of the rules that govern your workplace and written rules that people don't even know about. We can unpack that. Make sure you don't leave before the last session because Steph's going to show you how to look at that in even more detail. Never, ever underestimate the power of a really good story. Ah, sorry, just came up. Let me plug my computer back in here. I guess it's still plugged in. Let me just go back. You have to see the power of a really great story.
initiative and entrepreneurship, I think that makes sense as our contribution in the workplace, and being tech set. Does that set of eight skills make sense to you? That this would help us to set us up in the 2020s. So, what do you have to do in response to now having this information? Uh, what is your response? I think there are three responses. The first is your company needs this information because this is going to help you to not make a mess of the next few years. Too many companies are going to move too quickly to automation. They're going to automate things that shouldn't be automated. Just because something can be automated doesn't mean it should be if we need things like a human touch, diversity intelligence, complexity in the system. You know when it's gone too far when every second person who tries to connect with your automated system starts getting frustrated and saying, I need to speak to a manager. Okay? What can I speak to the manager means is this system is broken. Okay? I need somebody who will listen to me and will understand me in this moment. So our organizations need to realize, yes, of course, don't compete with the machines. Let the machines do what the machines can do best. But our task is to be more human and to work out where the humanity is in our systems. And this is a very important way to think strategically in our organizations. So our organizations need this information. The second thing we all need to do is we need to unlearn some of the things that we need. You see, learning is misunderstood very, very well bad. Learning is not just about adding new things. In fact, a lot of learning is about unlearning. Now, I, I discovered this a little while ago in a different context. I'm not a very good do-it-yourself kind of guy. Uh, I really am not. Uh, I just, I break things when I try and fix them, and it just gets messy. But every now and again, I don't know, there's something inside the masculine part of my body that feels the need to do something to do it yourself in the house. So uh, a little while ago, a few months ago, I saw a wall that needed painting in the house, and I thought, no, I can do this. And so I took a pot of paint, and I painted the wall, and I stood back, and it looked beautiful, and I thought, oh, I did it. Except, of course, a month or two later, it looked like this again. What hadn't I done? Yeah, most of you are looking at me like, seriously, you look clever, but now it's wrong. Uh, hey, I freely admit there are things I don't know. Uh, and this is one of the things I didn't know. Strip the wall first. That's what unlearning is. Okay? Unlearning is about stripping the wall first. Now, I thought I needed a way to help people to understand this. So what I did was I went out and I took something that most of us know how to do. And that is to ride a bicycle. But what I did is I re-engineered a bicycle so that it goes in the opposite direction, right? So that when I was copying this guy, who's a professor of neural science, who built a bike like this, and when you turn the bike's <laughs> wheels right, the wheels go left, when you turn it the other way, it goes this way. And I, the question was, can I retrain my brain to unlearn the old system of riding a bike and learn the new one? I'm prepared to say that none of you in this room can ride this bike. That it's impossible. Uh, I've had this bike for a month. I still can't ride it. So this one up here, he took eight months to switch his brain over. Now, I'm, I'm prepared to give 200 bucks to anyone who thinks they can ride this bike five meters. Anyone want to give it a go? Anyone thinks it can't be that difficult? Come, 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 come. So, you can do whatever you like. 
as long as you run it just five minutes to the president. Please don't show yourself health and safety. We have no insurance at this point. Okay, literally all you need to do is two steps and come and get your 200 bucks. I will give you 200 bucks if that's the best way to do it. I want to ask you, have you written one of these before? I've both of them. You can still have a thing. You're a gentleman. You're a gentleman. I don't want to run over my time. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Just for the record, because I'm behind you, I can't even do that yet. How many hours have you tried? <laughs> A long time. Many, many hours. Many, many hours. The reason we can't do that, and the reason only people like you have, hopefully myself, in a few days and months time, can do that, is because it takes you a long time to undo the neural networks that you've got. It takes you a long time to unlearn. And that's the second thing you need to do. You need to look at what it is you do and how you do it, and you need to ask what must be unlearned. The final piece of the puzzle the final thing that each of you must do, so there's an organizational question to ask, what must my, what must my organization learn? There's a, a learning question to ask, what must be unlearned and relearned? And then finally, there's a question to ask about which of these skills you need to focus your attention on. And here, I recommend you go to the website that we put together uh, for this. It's called the Future of Work Academy. You can have a look at our research. We put it up there all for free. Uh, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. You just go have a look at it for yourself. We've taken each of those eight areas of skills and we've developed a set of courses and lessons that you can do uh, online to help you develop those skills. The one thing you can do as an individual to take away from this conference today is you can look at that uh, set of eight skills and you can think, what, which of those eight am I pretty good at already? Start there. If you know anything about strength-based development, you don't start with your weakness, you start with your strength. And you develop it further. But then also ask, which is my greatest weakness? So of the eight areas, which are you already pretty good at? And which do you think needs a lot of work? Go and have a look at the Future of Work Academy website and tap into the lessons for those two areas. If you'd like a copy of my slides uh, and a link to a webinar which will take you through this content again so that you can share it with your teams, again, all for free, there it is over there. You'll see the link I've given you there. You might want to just write that down and take a photograph on the screen. If there's no www, but it's all lowercase letters bit.ly slash essays best speakers 30 October just for you guys just for today and you're welcome to share that with your team. The future of work has already begun but even if you're just setting yourself up for the 2020s it isn't just going to be more of the same. We're going to need to develop new skills personally, develop new sets of skills in our teams and set up our organizations to take advantage of this remarkable decade that is about to emerge. Thank you.